Good morning everybody, how are you? I'm really sorry not to be with you today. Welcome to my lounge. Uh, this is the third time that I have started recording. The first time the phone rang, the second time my neighbour has started streaming just outside the front of our house and so I'm just hoping that this the third time will work out for us. I wonder if I could let you into um, a little secret. A little bit of me has always hankered to be a celebrity. And I thought as I sat down to record this today, maybe this will be the start of my career as a TV vicar. Maybe this recording will get me a spot on Songs of Praise or Radio 2's Thought for the Day. Enough, Alison, I hear you say. So let's just pray together. Loving God, we ask you to come and speak to us this morning through your scriptures. We thank you for the wonders of technology, that we can still be together, although physically apart. I pray that you will open our hearts and minds as we pray. Teach us more about your desire, your ability to change and transform. In Jesus' name, Amen. So who can remember what our church vision is? I'm not there to give you any little clues. I can't hear you calling out from, uh, from Norwich. Hope that you all know it and it's at the top of your mind. Just in case it isn't, I'll just remind you that it is people and places made whole by the love and power of Jesus. And today is a first uh, part of a four part series when we are looking at scriptures, at testimonies of change and transformation, where the love and power of God has totally and completely transformed a situation or a life. And we're thankful to Martin for the testimony that he's just shared with us. And we're thankful for the scriptures that we've just heard that speak into, uh, into this theme. I wonder if you can conjure up in your mind an image of a smashed plate, not of one that has just kind of neatly broken into two or three pieces that maybe we could super glue back together, but one that is completely smashed, where there are loads of little kind of shivers of ceramic, where there is kind of dust, when there's maybe, I don't know, 10 or 12 different pieces, it's not easily going to go back together. And this image was the vision that I felt God give me for this series. Because normally if I dropped a plate and it was smashed like that, I would usually put it in the bin. I would think that it is broken beyond reasonable repair. I would consider it to be written off. But I felt God encourage me to think about the plate in a different way when we apply the power of God to it. Because, you know, God has the ability to transform, to change broken people and places and to make them whole again. And why would he do that? Because he loves us. And perhaps we can think of people and places. Maybe we can think of situations in our own lives which, like that plate, are completely shattered that are broken beyond what seems like reasonable to repair. But in this sermon series, we are learning about or reminding ourselves that the love and power of Jesus is transformational. It heals, it changes things, it restores, it changes hopeless situations, places and people. And I'm starting from the assumption of that broken plate because if we want to see something change, if we want to see something made whole, it's usually because it is pretty broken. No one sets out to change something that's already whole, that's already beautiful or working really well. So I just pray that you'll hold the image of that smashed plate in your mind. Today I've entitled the first sermon in our series, From Death to Life. And I just want to give a heads up about that knowing that for some of us, for, for some people listening this morning, that pain and grief is a really, um, 
a really strong part of your life at the moment. And if that's painful to you, then I, I just want to say that I, I, I don't want to cause you any more pain or grief. So listen while taking care of yourself. And just to share with you that while preparing and praying and reading ready for today, lots of this has spoken to me and has spoken into situations that I'm facing. And I just thought, isn't that one of the amazing things about God and about ministry? But this just isn't a sermon for you, definitely one for me too. So in Martin's testimony and in both of the Bible readings we've heard this morning, we encounter death. In the Gospel reading, we hear about a widow who has lost her son. This young man was definitely deceased. His body was being carried out of the house by the undertakers. Yet this wasn't the end of the story. Jesus didn't leave him dead. He was brought back to life. This is a very literal story about being changed from death to life. And in the Old Testament reading, we hear about another widow and her son. This time she's physically still alive, but effectively preparing for her death. She has no hope that her life will continue. The widow lives in Zarephath, and this is an area that has been plighted by drought. The king of the area, King Ahab, had been worshipping idols despite being warned not to do that. And earlier on in the passage, we read that Elijah warns him that there will be a drought. Elijah says there will be neither dew nor, drain, it, dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. I wonder if any of you have ever had to decide on a punishment or consequence maybe for a child or a grandchild or a pet or in an employment tribunal that you've been hearing. And you try and make the consequence or punishment meaningful to the person, something that will have an impact on them. Well, the area that, um, that we are in today in, in this Bible story was economically dependent on farming, on producing crops. It was an agricultural area, so the lack of water to the extent that there wasn't even dew in the early morning means that there will be a large scale famine, drought and subsequent death in this area. It was a national disaster. It was a consequence for King Ahab that hit him where it hurt. It was a reminder that although he was a powerful king, he was still subject to the wrath and mercy of God. And prior to the meeting the widow, which we read about in today's scripture passage, Elijah had been led by the Lord to the Kerith ravine. And it's here we read the scripture about Elijah being fed by ravens, who are not usually the most gregarious or altruistic of birds. And we read about him taking drinks from the brook. Drought had become so bad that we read at the start of today's passage that the brook had now completely dried up. Water is essential for life, and the lack of water on this scale would be huge. It's basically a death sentence on the people of this area. Their life source had been cut off. Their ability to water their crops, to grow food, which would in turn give them money to buy and to trade, has been cut off. And in this passage, we don't hear about the impact on the whole region. But the scripture drills down or hones in on the experience of one woman, of this widow and her son. And I've spoken to you before about widows, because in Bible times, they were some of the most vulnerable, the most disenfranchised of people. And I've wondered why Elijah was directed to her. Because although everyone was struggling with this famine and drought, this widow would have been the poorest of the poor. She's someone who perhaps we would hope to be on the receiving end of hospitality and kindness, not asked to give out of the very little that she had. And thinking about her, it kind of introduces the first theme which I hope that we would look at today, which is living under the shadow of death. 
in the passage, we read that the widow is out collecting sticks. And do you know, that means she has no servant. She has to do this herself. It means that she has no stick. She has no ability to make a fire. When she meets Elijah, we hear how she has resigned herself to death. She is at the brink of death. She plans to cook and eat her last meal with her son and then to die. I'm always surprised and to be honest, a little bit offended that Elijah seems so insensitive. What did Elijah do in this passage? When he realised her predicament, he didn't apologise and move on. He didn't help her. He didn't offer to collect sticks with her. Instead, he asked the widow for a little water. This, the most precious of commodities in the midst of a drought. And then he said, please bring me a little piece of bread. To be honest to me, this seems a bit cheeky. But this humble, generous woman obliges. This woman has no hope for her future. She's living under the shadow of death. And what does God, through Elijah, do for her? Well, when she goes to make the bread, she scoops out the flour and scoops out the oil. And instead of it being the very end of the pot, which would effectively have signified the end of her life, Elijah promises that the flour and the oil she has will not run dry. She will have food for as long as she needs it, for as long as the drought lasts. And this reminds me of other promises that God makes us. I think of like John 4, where God says that everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And in Isaiah 58, God says you will be like a garden that has plenty of water, like a spring that never runs dry. And it feels like God's introducing a concept here that what God has provided won't run dry. It speaks to me of being saved for eternity, not just for today, but of God's provision for all of her life. The fear of death has been broken. The power of death has been broken. She has the means to go on. This speaks to be about renewal, about coming back to God again and again. He doesn't run dry and he keeps filling us up. He keeps renewing us. I think back to the image of that shattered plate. This widow's life was shattered. Without the intervention of God, it was irredeemable. But God, through the ministry of Elijah, turned that situation around. The second idea that I'd like us to think about while we're in these scriptures is the concept of being spiritually dead while physically alive. I know this seems a bit strange, but bear with me. <laughs> in this story, the widow was physically still alive. There were definitely signs of life. She was out gathering her sticks. And this idea of being physically alive, but spiritually dead, again, is something that is well established in the Bible. And just a couple of examples of that is that I think of the story of the prodigal son. The son who went away was physically alive. Yet when he came home, his father said, I tell you the truth, this son of mine who was dead is alive again. And we know that he hadn't been physically dead, but relationally, he was dead to the father. The relationship between the son and the father had died. But in this story, we read that it comes back to life. There was a resurrection. And again, in John 5, 24 and 25, we get this concept taught to us. Jesus is speaking about his authority. He says, whoever hears my word and believes will have crossed over from death to life. And again, this isn't speaking about people who are physically dead. It's another, um, an, another example of the spiritual resurrection 
that we can receive in Jesus. The widow was physically alive but had no hope for the future. And really this describes all of us before we knew Jesus. We were all spiritually dead, physically alive, but our spirits were dead to Christ until we accepted him as our Lord and Saviour. It's an odd thought to think that we can be physically alive, but spiritually dead. So can you see that when we give our lives to Jesus, a spiritual resurrection takes place? Our souls that were dead to Christ are brought to life. The concept that when we give our lives to Jesus, our souls are resurrected. So if we think again about the image of that shattered plate, it was irredeemable, it was irreparable. But God brings new life. And the third idea that these scriptures spoke to me about today was about physical death. You know that in the past few weeks, my dad has been very ill and we've been preparing ourselves for him to die. And I'm not with you in person this morning as I'm in Norwich with my family. Death and what happens to us when our earthly life finishes has been very much at the forefront of my mind. So when I'm preparing to preach and on being changed by the love and power of Jesus, in particular around the theme of from death to life, I can't help but draw on my own recent experiences. We're preparing ourselves for my dad's earthly life to come to an end. He's preparing himself to die. All the care and treatment that he's receiving at the moment is preparing him for his death. But while we're very conscious of this, we are also very conscious about the new life that my dad is about to start. Dad knows Jesus. He knows who's waiting for him. He knows where he is going. And we know that this isn't the end of his life, but the start of a new wonderful life with Jesus for all of eternity. And in the New Testament reading in Luke, we read of Jesus' distress at the widow's bereavement. It says about Jesus that his heart went out to her. And you know, at the moment that gives me such comfort, just to remind myself that Jesus sees the pain that we are in when we lose someone we love. But in this story, we read how death wasn't the end. Because Jesus spoke and the widow's son was brought back to life. And to be honest, we don't see this physical resurrection very often anymore. But we do know that Jesus gives all of us the chance of new life, the chance of eternal life. We all have the opportunity to rise again, but sadly not in the way that this story describes, to be reunited with our families. Death is one of life's great mysteries. There isn't a lot of scientific evidence and understandably, there aren't many lived experiences or testimonies. But I suggest that even if we don't understand all of these details, there is something in this passage for each of us here. That when we come to the end of our earthly journey, we have nothing to fear. Because physical death isn't the end of the road. When we come to the end of our life here on earth, death isn't the end. We have the promise of new and eternal life with Christ in heaven. So no matter how we die, where or when we die, whatever our physical condition, we have a promise from God that cannot be broken. A promise of eternal life, the ultimate change from death to life. So we're all in different places this morning. We all have a unique set of circumstances and I hope that there has been something in this message for you today. At the end of the New Testament passage in Luke, it says God has come to help his people. What a comfort that is. God is here to help us. So as we draw to a conclusion, can I recap and ask you the following questions? Have you had a spiritual resurrection? 
Have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Saviour? If this is something that you would like to know more about, then there are people that would love to talk with you about that this morning, to pray with you or to help explain what that means. And if you're not ready for that yet, then please can I ask that when you leave this place, you might just start a conversation, start to talk to God about what it is to have a spiritual resurrection. Ask Jesus to just reveal himself to you. And I believe that he will. I thought maybe there are people listening this morning that have had something like the drought that we read about going on in your life. Something that has been like a drought for a long time. I think about Elijah sitting by the stream, effectively watching it dry up, thinking about life ebbing away. I think about the widow who dipped into the pots, watching the contents of her flour and her oil steadily decreasing, not knowing if or how it will ever get refilled. And I thought maybe there are people here this morning who feel that your life source has been drying up. That maybe you once knew what it was to feel spiritually alive, but your hope over time has faded. Maybe you can associate with the widow where you say, I am still physically alive, but I feel so hopeless. Hope is gone. And I just want to encourage you this morning that you are not beyond help. That rain is on the way. That rain is coming. And this morning, I just pray for you to be filled afresh with God's Holy Spirit. That you will be refreshed and renewed. And like the widow's jar, you will be encouraged that with God, your life source will not run dry. And finally, perhaps you or someone you know is approaching the end of life here on earth. And there is good news for you in this message too. Because in death, Jesus does not leave us. It is the end of one life, but we have hope in him for a new life for all of eternity. And that's the ultimate change that happens, isn't it? When we talk about from death to life. This widow lives in Zarephath. And you know, the name Zarephath means smelting pot. Can you imagine what that is? I think about it as a big pot where different things are put in, put in usually metal things and melted down. I think, you know, instead of those items being discarded, they are melted down and transformed. They are made into something new. And I really like that image of broken, purposeless things going into the pot. The fire of God melting them. And it gives material for something new to be made. And you know, that's the invitation of God to us this morning. We can all be changed, transformed, renewed by the love and power of Jesus from death to life, whatever that means to you today. I pray that you just know God working in your life. So Holy Spirit, I pray for each one of us here this morning, that in this moment now, that as we approach you at your table and receive communion, that you would fill us afresh and that we would each be transformed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you. See you really soon. Bye.